Always. We ask the question. What is the question world? Bivši predsjednik Tunisa, borac za ljudska prava i političar, Moncef Marzuki, po drugi put je u egzilu u Francuskoj. Za Al Jazeera govori o situaciji u Tunisu, zašto smatra da će biti treći val arapskog proljeća i o dvostrukim standardima zapada prema arapskim zemljama. So Mr. Marzuki, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Now, we are here in Sarajevo in Bosnia and as you know, back in 2020, Uh, the Human Freedom Index uh, considered Bosnia the most liberal of all Muslim-majority countries. Now, you have been here for a couple of days. I was wondering, when you walk through Sarajevo, Mostar, and other places through Bosnia, what is the first, what are your, uh, you know, what's the first perception you get? First of all, I would like to say that uh, we are here in, uh, in Sarajevo, in Bosnia, because we couldn't uh, have our uh, meeting in any Arab country. And I can say that in any European country. So uh, Sarajevo is, uh, for us, has been the last chance to have this meeting uh, between uh, Arab Democrats. Uh, this is why I'm very grateful to the, to, to the Bosnian government, to the Bosnian people, and to Sarajevo. I, uh, uh, yes, I walked uh, yesterday to have a mm -hmm. look at the Sarajevo. First of all, I was struck by the beauty of the country, by the beauty of the city. And also, it reminds me how this uh, city suffered from the, th for, for, from the civil war. I remember that at, at the time we were uh, extremely uh, involved with emotionally with the, with, the, with the, the Bosnian people because, of course, because of the relationship of religion, etc., and also because it was uh, 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 people fighting for uh, for uh, for freedom and for dignity. This is why we we th we found ourselves in uh, in this uh, in this struggle. So um, I am really very happy, very happy to be here, and uh, I walked it through the. Um, You know the old city, and sometimes I felt like at home in, in Tunisia. You know, so similar in some way that I, I feel really very comfortable to be here. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say that Sarajevo was the only place, Bosnia was the only place where you could have this conference and talk about democratization of the Middle East, what does it tell you about the current state of affairs in the Middle East and also in Europe as well? It yes. seems that European far right extremists and Arab yes. autocrats are on the same page now. Yes, ab uh, absolutely, absolutely, and. Uh, Really, it's it's a bad time for Democrats. I must say that it's a very bad time. I feel that the the democratic wave now is uh, you know is uh, facing a lot of uh, challenges, a lot of trouble. This is why we couldn't have this meeting in any Arab country. Imagine that we have 22 Arab countries. It was impossible for us to to, to meet because in some places it would be, have been very dangerous for some opponent, uh, Saudi opponent or Emiratis also. So it was impossible, and and uh, in, in the case Europe, of Europe, yeah, the Europe, the problem of visa, you know, they don't give visa to the to to, to, to foreign right. It's extremely difficult for any uh, human rights activist or uh, within the country to get visa. So the only uh, the only way the the only country that has is uh, is Bosnia. Mm -hmm. It means that Bosnia for us now is something like you know uh, an oasis of freedom in in this ocean of. Uh, I wouldn't say dictatorship because Europe is not a dictatorship, but hostility you know, to, the, to democrats, hostility to the Arab uh, uh, democratization process. Right, but before we move on to, to the Middle East and the Arab world, I mean, you say that Bosnia is the way you perceive it as an oasis uh, compared to, to uh, Arab, uh, Arab countries. Um, many people in Bosnia are voting with their feet and moving towards Western Europe because of the bad socioeconomic and political situation. However, Um, uh, do you think that, I mean, does it seem that they take g the freedom in this country for granted? I'm afraid that they are uh, running after an illusion, you know, because uh, now for the moment I, uh, I live in, in, in France and I am really very upset by the fact that I, I feel that uh, the far right is rising and I'm afraid that Maybe uh, one day it will be extremely difficult to be foreigner in this country. I hope not, because I have I know that the, uh, France has a very strong civil society, and a lot of many French has, you know, sided with us uh, during the revolution, etc. But I'm afraid by the the, the rise of far right, not only in France, in Italy, in yeah. uh, uh, everywhere, everywhere, 
And this far right is mainly anti-Muslim, you know. The, yeah. the Islamophobia is at the core of this uh, new racism. It's no longer uh, anti-Semitism, you know, like uh, during the uh, last century. But now this racism is more focused on Muslims, any Muslims. And the Islamophobia is extremely worrying for me. Uh, you know, Muslims are... Uh, the majority of, the, of, of Muslims in the Western country are middle class people, right. uh, educated, integrated. And so this is why I feel it's unjust, you know, for the, for, to give of Muslim this image uh, about, you know, just because we have, uh, we have some terrorists, very few terrorists, like in any culture, in any nation. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that uh, this majority, this vast majority integrated, uh, well educated, uh, ready to, to to work for 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 the the, the benefit of of the society, etc., is is unjustly accused to be uh, to be t terrorist, etc., mm -hmm. etc. So, um, what well, for the moment it's up to us to, right. to defend democracy everywhere. Now let's let's talk about um, democracy in the in the Arab world. I mean. You know, the, the famous Ottoman Tunisian, uh, you know, statesman Haredin Pasha in the second half of the 19th century, uh, he famously remarked, speaking of democracy, that, quote, the ruler doesn't want it and the people are not ready for it. And now this slogan, the people are, are not ready for it, I'm afraid that it has been used by a number of... Uh, all the time. This, the, this phrase has been used all the time. By Arab autocrats to by justify Arab tyranny. Autocrats. And I use it to say, okay, uh, I, I will be agree with you, but please... Tell me, when do you think that we will be ready for democracy? Give me just, uh, just a date. Tell me it will be in one century or in 50 years, but just give me a date. No, no, they won't. Of course, it's, for us. it's, uh, it's an excuse because, you know, um, the main problem in our countries is corruption. This, that must be very, uh, this is the core of the dictatorship, corruption. So the people who are the elite, this corrupt elite on, uh, holding on power because they are they are afraid to, to lose their um, their benefits, so of course it's never time for us to give up. To give up. There's the same situation in Central Asia where these elites, very yeah. corrupt elites, yeah. are clinging on to power for the last 30 years, exactly, and having essentially hereditary demo, uh, republics whereby the son takes over the father, exactly. and exactly. in the case of the Arabs, mostly exactly. uh, monarchies and uh, exactly. So. But I am always asked, uh, do, do you think that the Arab, is, uh, Arab Spring is over? And my response is no. It's the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. I do believe it because, look, we have had this uh, first burst of revolution in 2011. And then we have had the second wave in 2016 in Sudan, uh, less known in Sudan, yes. in Iraq, yes. in, in Lebanon, in Algeria. Do you see this as a continuation of the Arab Spring? Of course, of course. And, uh, and now I am... I'm waiting for the third wave, and the third wave could be very much more violent and much more destructive than the, the two waves, the wave of 2011 and the, the wave of 2016. That was exactly my, my next question. I mean, I mean, you know, many people are quick to denounce the Arab Spring as a failure. However, uh, I found Noah Feldman's book, uh, The Arab Winter, a tragedy, quite, quite interesting in the sense that he makes a very sensible argument saying that the Arab Spring manifested a very genuine and, uh, you know, a generally noble and collective effort at self-determination by, by Arab-speaking people in a number of countries. And of course, we should bear in mind that such turbulent changes can go awry. But let's not forget that the French Revolution took them at least 150 years before, before it became a full-fledged democracy. And there were still cases such as the 1968 massacre of uh, Algerians in Paris, right? Yeah. Carried out by the, by the French police. So um, is it too early to talk now about the successes of the Arab Spring? Of course, of course. I always remember uh, some people of the, you know, this, uh, I quote, Shuenlai, Shuenlai, um, uh, you know, Shuenlai was the former prime minister of China yeah. in the six, 60s or 70s. He came uh, in official visit in France and he was asked, what's your assessment about the French Revolution? He said, it's too early to say. It. It's too <laughs> early to say. Yes. And this is exactly yes. the same. Look. What I am sure of is now the process has begun, and this process will never stop until we reach uh, our objective. It's exactly the same, uh, uh, the same thing for the, what I call our first independence. You know, we were occupied by the French in the uh, 1981. Uh, mm -hmm. It took us about eight decades, you know, to become free from the, to, to become independent. This mm -hmm. was our first battle for the first independence. Now, our battle for democracy, I call it the battle for sec the second independence, 
it has begun just after the independence, and it's, uh, uh, it never stops. Right. We have had a lot of uh, uh, failure. We have had a lot of disappointment. A lot of people have paid a high price, jail, torture, etc., etc. But the process never stopped. And this, what happened in 2011, was just an episode of this, this war. Yeah. So even if we have lost this battle, we are going to win the war. The process will never stop until we reach our objective, which means a state of law, democracy, people of citizens and not people of subject, etc. Right, but um, you know, many uh, Arab monarchies attempted to contain the 2011 uh, uprisings you know, in a broadly similar manner by granting monetary incentives, by limiting political uh, concessions, you know, uh, and by giving out uh, l you know, limited political concessions, and then they also combined it with repressive tactics uh, which uh, to, to constrain you know, persistent protesters. Now, uh, my question to you is, for how long can Arab uh, monarchies buy loyalty? I would say as much as they have money. Uh, I think the Saudi, the Emiratis, they have a lot of money, so they can, I, I think they can postpone what, what, what's, what should be the normal outcome, which means the state of law and no, uh, no longer under the control of corrupt elite. But for, for countries like say, Tunisia uh, or Morocco or, or Algeria or uh, Egypt now, where the elite cannot have enough money, you know, to you know to keep quiet the population and well, where you have a rising level of poverty, etc. I expect that it it won't take long. We are going to have a new wave of revolution before I think the next decades will be terrible for the the whole region because the level of poverty and the level of corruption, the level of violence is so important, so huge that it's like a volcano, you know, the volcano. Now, yeah. for the moment, the volcano are, you know, are it's still. dormant, yeah, but yeah. it will erupt. But you, you don't know, w uh, you know that this volcano would burst, you don't know when, but you can be sure that the volcano would burst. Right, so do you, but for how long can uh, Gulf monarchies continue to sustain dictatorships such as the case of Egypt? Uh, no, well, no. They, they can still continue to meddle in, the, in Tunisia, no, and yes, Algeria, and yes, elsewhere. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, I, I think in Egypt or uh, Tunisia, the level of corruption and the, of inefficiency of the government is so so high that we are going to have, even if uh, the, the Saudi or the Emirati put a lot of money. By the way, they are not. They, uh, for, for the moment, they began to be very, very uh, cautious about yeah. uh, funding uh, SCC, etc. Now, ago, yes, now yes. they are they are much more uh, mm, you cautious. Know, cautious. Yeah. So. But for, for the, uh, the, those monarchy, I think the, the model for the, those monarchy is Singapore, you know, Singapore, yes, yes. maximum of uh, wealth and minimum of freedom. I am not sure that they, w they would be able, you know, to, 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 uh, to succeed, to have this uh, uh, model of uh, Singapore, because in Singapore, the most important thing is f the fighting against corruption, yes. you know. While in those monarchy, corruption is the main problem. So I guess that Singapore managed to root out new, its corruption yeah, the, in the 1980s. The new, yes. yes, the new generation, the new generation, you know, extremely uh, uh, linked to the, the modern world. I'm sure that the next generation will never accept, you know, to live under the same corrupt elite than uh, dominated the country for four centuries. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, you know the counter revolutionary axis in the Middle East, you know. The Saudis, the Emiratis, and Egypt—they uh, managed to, you know, uh, depict all demonstrators in 2011 as nothing more than Islamists bent on, you know, uh, toppling uh, old regimes and establishing Islamic states. Now, the European far right, uh, right fell for this narrative. Now, how do you explain the links between European far right and Arab counter-revolutionaries, and even Israel, which supports these counter-revolutionary governments in the Middle East? Well. First of all, the, the, the revolution in Egypt and in, uh, in Tunisia and the, 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 all the Arab countries was not an Islamist revolution. It was a democratic revolution. That, that was f for sure. Uh, now, the, because, because the, 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 in, in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, Islamists won the first election, I think that the European did, didn't understand the fact. They thought that the population was uh, was accepting to have a religious state. They didn't understand that, in fact, uh, people vote for the for, for another in, in, in the entity because they thought this uh, political party is not a corrupt party. And they wanted for change. Uh, it for change. It was not at all for for uh, for, uh, for religious reasons. Yeah. This is what I have tried to explain to my. For, 
the, you know, head of states in France. But do, they, do they understand this? Yes, no, they didn't understand that. They were extremely cautious about what kind of democracy they were bringing Islamists to power. And they used to say, look, let them govern. And they would say that probably the, in the next election, they, they, they would do the election as uh, we can have a secular government. But for the moment, if you are Democrats, you have to accept that uh, democracy can, can give power to the to, to Islamists. They were extremely cautious about the fact that the Islamists were uh, in charge. And they didn't, of course, I can assure you that they didn't anything to, to help us economically. I, 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 I mean, at the time, we, we badly needed but economic help. Why did European governments and the U.S. government as well, why did they want to have, uh, you know, uh, democracies according to their own terms? No, no, they, they were not interested in having democracy in our country because they were good friends with, with the dictatorship. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but uh, they have never been interested in uh, uh, promoting democracy in our country. Uh, the only thing that sometimes they, uh, I have had a lot of discussion with some of them saying, look, uh, it's sure that uh, there are some human rights abuses. We are going to, to make some pressure on the, on, on the government, but, but it's, it's good for you to have stable government and uh, uh, strong government and fighting against terrorists, etc. In fact, they were very, very happy with the, with the dictatorship. Look what's happened after the coup in Egypt. Nothing happened to the to, to ACC. He was accepted everywhere. And you remember that uh, President Trump said, "Hey, this is my preferred dictator about CCC." So I, I I must say that they are very uh, they are not interested in promoting democracy. And, and it's interesting that the U.S. government never really formally uh, characterized the the coup in Egypt as a coup. They called it the removal of President Mohamed Morsi. Yeah. Because otherwise they would have they would be obliged to stop their military aid, which they send on a basis. The same thing in Tunisia. Exactly. We're asking them to, to, to say that what's happened in They've Tunisia, never called it, it a coup. It's, it's, it's a constitutional coup, but it's a coup, but they never, never, never accepted to recognize it. This is why I always say that we, to promote democracy in our country, we have to rely on ourselves. Uh, for many reasons, political or uh, you know, cultural reason, uh, the West would uh, uh, help Romanian or uh, Polish or Ukrainian, etc., but not Arabs. I'm sorry to say that. But that is interesting to note. Exactly in the in the 19, 1990s, when, com uh, when communism was collapsing, they were very interested in promoting democracy in Eastern Europe. Yeah. But when it came to the Middle East, they opted for stabilocracy. Yeah. Um, despite spending years and years of talking about the need to democratize the, the Middle East to respect human rights, do you think this was all this was all empty talk? Yeah, empty talk. But I'm sure I'm afraid that they will. Uh, they are weakening their own democracy. Look, now the, the, mo the most d important danger for democracy in, in the Western country is far right, okay? Because mm -hmm. far right has been always anti-democrat. And the far right now, uh, who is uh, fueling the far right in, uh, uh, in those countries? It's our situation, our political situation, our, the, the migrant coming right. from North Africa, etc. So more, mi more migrant may mean the rise of the uh, of the far right and the f it's the real danger for the, the 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 western democracy so in fact by weakening our democracy they are weakening theirs yes, well. and this is what they don't understand you know mm -hmm. now, mr Brzezuki, how, how do you make sense of the so-called normalization process between arab majority countries in israel is this being it's being spearheaded by from top top down uh, by, by governments, but do you think that it's, it has the popular support of the people? No, 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 no popular support at all. But uh, now for, the, for those governments, they give a damn of, of popular support because th they are convinced that uh, our public opinion have no, no, no weight, that uh, no weight, they yeah. can be protected only by the, the, the Western government. Or the, it's a, this is why they try to... Uh, myself, I, I would like to, to see peace, I would like to see uh, uh, maybe a solution of one state where Jews and Arabs live together with, what, with our apartheid, etc. This, uh, I think, a lot of Arabs would accept this. But this is not the case. The case is uh, it's an apartheid state, uh, the, the Palestinian has no right, etc. And you have to accept it. And they call it this normalization. It's not normalization. It's, in fact, acceptance of something that is unacceptable. So do you think that in the long run, this is not sustainable? 
No, it's not necessary because everywhere you, where you will have a democratic government, the democratic government will never accept this kind of normalization of Israel. We accept peace, but we do not accept surrender, you know, to, and to, 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 to give up all the, the, the rights for Palestinians. That's will never accepted by the, our public opinion. Right. Now, um, uh, as, as we come towards the end of this interview, um, so you said that you expect a second, uh, actually a third, third wave, wave. Yes. of democratization uh, in the Arab world within the next decade. Yeah. Uh, do you think it will hit um, Gulf monarchies first or other countries? No, for, um, you know, look, uh, uh, now for the moment, for the situation in countries like Egypt, like Tunisia, like Algeria, the situation is unbearable for the, for the, the whole population, uh, the level of poverty, the level of you know, frustration, the level of, uh, of you know, uh, people are extremely angry, etc., etc. Uh, they have done everything, you know, to, to, to sabotage our revolution. But now the counter revolution is in charge everywhere, and this counter revolution is uh, has totally failed. So what I'm expecting is because of the the, the very reason that you know that we were behind the, the first explosion in 2011. The very reason are still there. So I expect a new wave. But what I'm afraid of is that could be much more violent because. The elite now is extremely, uh, uh, extremely worried about the fact that look, uh, this this could be our last chance. Yeah. And the other side, you know, the young people uh, are saying, "Hey, you um, talk to me or to Ranoushi, or the, you have tried, you know, to to, to reach kind of agreement with the old system. You have tried the uh, transitional justice, etc. Forget about all this. Those guys that don't understand anything th but violence. And this could be extremely uh, fun because fear." and hatred and this could be uh, uh, extremely dangerous for the situation this is why i would try everything this is why we have here this meeting between democrats so to say we have to be very careful because the next explosion could be extremely violent and we have to do something you know to prevent this so we can channel all the all this wrath all this uh, you know this uh, feeling the bad feeling and uh, stick to the first choice which means peaceful democratic revolution. Uh, I should have asked you before, but uh, I, I forgot to do so. Uh, were you disappointed at the role played by the ulama, the Islamic scholars, in justifying tyranny in a way? That's what always, you know, during all history, uh, some part of the were with the, with the tyranny and others were with, with, with the revolution. I can, I can tell you that we have a lot of scholars, you know, supporting our, uh, our struggle for democracy. For the, and I am happy to see that a lot of Muslims now are coming uh, to the, this very specific and very important idea that there is no contradiction between Islam and democracy, that we can be, have a real, genuine democracy without giving up our religion. We took time for this idea, idea yes. to mature. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right, Mr. Marzuki, it was a pleasure speaking to you. It's, Thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure, too. Thank you.